Good morning. Thanks uh, very much, Shatine, and welcome to the University of uh, Waterloo, everyone. The uh, first uh, panel uh, today is on energy transitions for a decarbonized economy, how fast and at uh, what cost. Um, just to give you uh, uh, a very small bit of, um, of context for this, for this panel, uh, right now, the global carbon budget, the total amount of CO2 that can be emitted in a sort of finite amount, um, is estimated to be about seven to 800 gigatons of CO2. Canada's share of that, if it was based on Canada's current share of global emissions, would be about 14 gigatons of CO2. So that's the amount of carbon we can um, emit for, forever. That amount would be seen as grossly inequitable by the rest of the world. An amount that would be seen as equitable by the rest of the world would be something in the order of four to six gigatons of carbon. At 14 gigatons, that gives us approximately, at current emission rates, about a 20-year supply of carbon. So that means that we have to reduce our emissions um, fast and at a cost <laughs> that allows us um, to do that. And that, of course, is an extraordinarily complicated, um, both politically and technically, um, undertaking. Luckily, we have some, um, some very uh, smart and capable people who have some ideas about how we might do that, and we've gathered four of them here, here today. Um, and speaking in, um, in, in the order um, from, my, from my left um, across um, is Heather Douglas. Heather is the Waterloo Chair in Science and Society. She is a philosopher and, an, uh, and the Associate Director of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. Um, and she does work in the intersection of, of science and science policy and will be uh, speaking about um, long-term transitions at the local level and I think some of the decarbonization work that she's been doing in the Waterloo region. Sarah Birch is a Canada Research Chair in Sustainable Governance and Innovation. She's a colleague of mine at the Faculty of Environment in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. She is also a colleague of mine at the Center for Governance, um, uh, International Governance uh, Innovation. Uh, Sarah does uh, work on transformative responses to climate change at the community scale and innovation and she'll be speaking about accelerating decarbonization through innovation. Thanks, Armageddon. Followed by Sarah will be Ian Lipton. Ian is the president of the Carbon Accounting Company um, and has been responsible for strategic development of environmental sustainability programs and software designs uh, for a number of economic sectors, including global hospitality. Uh, he's an expert in carbon management and an entrepreneur and uh, teaches uh, at the University of Toronto in addition to his entrepreneurial activities. And I think he hires uh, Waterloo students, including some of our students, and, uh, and we're certainly grateful um, um, for, for that. And finally, uh, Tim Gibbons, who's the business development manager at the Ontario Centers of Excellence. Um, and uh, Tim's been uh, working at OCE for 15 years in the energy sector, uh, helping uh, investors and the university sector uh, in invest to commercialize innovation uh, in, the, in the energy sector. Uh, and Tim will be, uh, will be speaking also on um, pathways to, to innovation. So without further uh, ado, I think the speakers are going to speak for about uh, 12 to 14 minutes, and then we'll have about uh, 15 minutes for, for questions and uh, from, from, from the microphones. Heather. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, what I want to do is talk to you about a project that I ran last year on uh, how to decarbonize the local energy systems for the region of Waterloo. Um, in the Waterloo region, about 94% of our greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted in the area that's about a half million people around the University of Waterloo comes from energy use. 
So thinking about energy use is really important for our own local greenhouse gas emissions profile. The remaining 6%, about 5% are from agriculture, 1% from landfills. So we did not tackle that in our project, but 94% of our local greenhouse gas emissions are from energy use and from fossil fuel use. So currently in the region, uh, the Sustainable Waterloo region, which is a great uh, NGO organization, has crafted together um, a, a short-term goal of a re to reduce emissions by 6% below 2010 levels by 2020. This is obviously not deep decarbonization. It is a laudable goal. I think apparently we are on track to meet it. Hooray. But that's not going to get us to tackling the carbon budget that, that Neil laid out for us. So how do we get to deep decarbonization? How do we do this locally? And I decided to address it at the local level because most energy solutions need to be locally envisioned and implemented. They depend upon local climatic conditions, local sun resources. What is the sun angle here? How does that affect photovoltaic? Production, it depends on our deep geological substrate, if we're going to talk about geothermal. It depends upon our own hydrological systems, if we talk about hydroenergy. It depends upon our current local infrastructure. So we have to think about these things very often tied to, ultimately, the local levels and the places where we live. So you might be asking, why should the Waterloo Region do this? Isn't this a global problem? Of course it is. But we have to start thinking about the energy transitions where we live if we're going to get traction on this. And there are certainly global reasons to think about this. Cur currently, um, we now know that continuing to use fossil fuels the way we're doing it harms the least well-off in the world. It's the most vulnerable populations in different parts of the world that will be the most impacted, the worst impacted first. So it becomes a global justice issue. In addition, I've been living in Canada now for five years. It always amazes me how many Canadians actually love winter. I want to have winter. I want to have those backyard ice rinks. Canadians care about this. So for self-interest reasons, if we want to have a robust winter and not have Februarys like we just had, then we need to do something about this. And then there's the self-interest plus justice issue, which uh, arises because this will become an increasingly palpable human rights issue as we move forward, as the impacts of climate change are seen and felt, especially by the world's most vulnerable. And Canada wants to be on the right side of history on this issue. We don't want to be a country that lags behind. And currently, this is what our emissions profile looks like compared to the world. So as per capita emissions for the top 10 emitters, Canada is number one. This is not a, something to be proud of. So we need to start thinking about this deeply and aggressively um, because that, those 14 gigatons are probably not actually going to be available to us as we think about this in an increasingly global justice issue. So getting back to the local level, what we did here was run a two-day workshop in November. Uh, there were 50 local experts, mostly from outside academia, to keep it grounded in the real world. We did have a lot of academic experts like Sarah and Paul Parker were there, and people from WISE, but a lot of people from outside academia. We worked within these sorts of plausibility constraints. We presume that we will have the housing stock that we have, that we're not going to tear down all the houses and rebuild them, although it might be easier in some ways. We did it be super expensive and create a lot of political resistance. Um, we're going to have the road patterns that we have, so we have a fairly sprawly, although not as bad as some American cities, but a fairly sprawly infrastructure. That is not going to go away by 2050. Um, we can do infill development, we can densify the urban cores of Waterloo and Kitchener and Cambridge, but um, the general rough pattern of, of uh, density is going to be the same. Uh, we do not presume that we will have any breakthrough technology, so we do not say, and then fusion will come along and save the day. We presume that we're going to work with the technologies that are currently available, even those that are not widely used. And we also tried to work with Ontario growth projections of 50% population growth in this region by 2050 which means there's going to be increase for energy demand as well as trying to decarbonize. So the goal for the workshop was to generate multiple plausible scenarios for how to achieve a decarbonized energy system in the water of the region by 2050. So how do we get all the fossil fuels out? That was the goal. And here is a picture of the challenge. So one of the things we started with was an image of our current energy systems where everything is converted into a single energy unit across different kinds of fuels. 
This is very helpful for visualizing the challenge. So what you see here is first on the left, a picture of current energy use. Each square is one petajoule, whether it comes from fossil fuels or electricity. So you see residential energy there, transportation, industrial, commercial, institutional, those are the sectors of use. Current energy sources for the region, 64 petajoules, 15 petajoules that are not fossil fuels. Right, so very heavy dependence on gasoline, natural gas, diesel, um, especially for transportation and for thermal use. Right, so that's where we are now. Even if we decarbonize our electricity system, that's not going to help much um, going forward, especially if we talk about fuel switching and shifting those um, thermal energy and transportation needs to electricity, that's going to create a huge increase in demand for electricity. And so this is a way of representing those issues in a palpable, concrete way. Just to give you a sense of what each of one of those squares is, you might notice the University of Waterloo is its own petajoule because this uni university uses about a petajoule of energy a year, which is a lot. We could do something about that. But here's what a petajoule is, roughly. It's the amount that 40,000 six kilowatt hour photovoltaic systems will produce in a year in this region. We have about 100,000 rooftops, so we're not going to solve it, solve the problem, unfortunately, with photovoltaics. It sort of allows you to see that. It's the amount that, of energy that 47, two and a half megawatt wind turbines can produce in a year. It's the amount the University of Waterloo uses in a year. It's the amount needed to heat about 10,000 average Canadian homes, current average Canadian homes in a year. And it's the amount of energy that is saved for if we switch 41,000 cars to electric vehicles just by efficiency gains, we would save a, pet, um, a petajoule. Right? So that sort of gives you an idea of the scale of what a petajoule is across different kinds of fuel sources. So here was the challenge that participants in our workshop were confronted with. Currently we use about 64 petajoules. If we scale up to 50% in population, we've got a 100 petajoule challenge in the region of Waterloo. And uh, we divided that up, we kept the scale for residential, industrial, commercial, institutional, transportation. How do we fill all these boxes, all these demands for pedigule? We could do it through demand reduction, that's the blue. And by the end of the workshop, we all agreed there's no way we're tackling this problem at all without significant demand reduction through efficiency gains. And then, can we do it with renewable energy? That's the green. So each, um, each sector had a table devoted to it, each sector of use, and then each sector of production. And we got to play with stickies, and each sticky represented actual infrastructure changes. So this is the kind of thing that was produced in the workshop. Uh, on the left, you see some of the demand sections. Uh, that's Sarah Birch's transportation vision there, right? <laughs> She ran that table. <laughs> uh, industrial, commercial, institutional, residential came up with a couple of different scenarios. And then you see the supply sectors. The supply sectors are trying to max out energy production across renewable electricity, across, um, or at least decarbonized electricity, across biofuels, and across thermal. Thermal was unable to give me actual petajoule amounts. It turned out we didn't have the expertise. Even among the best people that we knew who worked on thermal energy issues, they were unable to convert, to say what the conversion would be to actual petajoule amounts. So there's a research there that needs to be done, sort of lack knowledge. Um, and as you can see, no matter how you squint, the supply side does not add up to the demand side. Like, it's just, they don't add up. So, we ended up not producing any plausible scenarios of how to decarbonize the Waterloo region by 2050. Um, which was very informative, given who was in the room. We had you know, a lot of the best people in the region, and we still couldn't do it. So that means there are things we need to know. We need to know how to achieve at least a 50% demand reduction across all sectors of use, or we can't do this. How do we actually ramp up the efficiency of our infrastructure? How do we maximize local renewable energy production, solar, biomass, thermal, without infringing on other sustainability concerns and demands? What can we do there? How do we, for example, um, maximize use of uh, photovoltaics 
across not just home rooftops, but perhaps commercial and parking lots. How do we electrify the transportation system to reduce and reduce individually owned vehicles? How do we, um, so we're not going to be able to get rid of individually owned vehicles, I don't think, given the way in which our region is built. It's plausible to suggest that we can have a transit system that served the entirety of all these communities effectively. Um, how would autonomous vehicles affect this? Um, what kinds of things can we do for public transportation? And finally, how do we figure out how to replace the natural gas dependency on thermal that is such a big part of our current local carbon budget? Um, could we do this with geothermal? Could we either deep or um, shallow geothermal heat pumps? Could we do this with solar thermal and seasonal storage? Are there technologies that are tried elsewhere, that are deployed elsewhere, that we could really deploy here? And what would that look like? So there ends up, we ended up without scenarios, but we ended up with research questions that need to be pursued to understand how to think about these things. We also discussed how to create some of the transformative changes that are needed to um, tackle these problems. And uh, in particular, we talked about policy issues that are linked across municipal, provincial, and federal levels of governance. And I think Sarah's going to talk more about this, how you actually gain um, coordination across these tiers of governance. So we ended up with sort of policy recommendations that uh, span across tiers of governance. So we're thinking, of, for example, about how do we make our homes radically more efficient? How do we do that 50% demand reduction in our houses? Yes, building codes will help, but most houses that people will live in in 2050 will not be new buildings. So we need to think about retrofits. How do we get the retrofits to happen? And we talked about things like requiring an Enter Guide rating or similar instrument at the point of sale for all houses. It's, it's something that could be required at the municipal level. And um, perfect. Uh, and we could uh, we have to figure out also how to craft policies to encourage rental properties to retrofit for efficiency. Because right now, rental properties are a bit of a policy no man's land. Um, so we could talk about that. At the provincial level, in addition to the strengthening of building codes, requiring homes to meet minimum enter guide ratings tied to the age of the home. And we could ramp those up as we sort of move forward. And that would create a moment for homeowners to think about energy and to think about the efficiency of their homes. And at the federal level, requiring that home financial instruments um, take into account enter guide rating, so as part of the assessment of the building and as part of the mortgage rate structure. So there's sort of ways in which we could leverage policy instruments across the different tiers of governance to create the kind of radical transformation that we need. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Um, <laughs> we did something similar. You could do similar things across uh, transportation, various sorts of tiers of governance instruments leveraging to create the kinds of transformation. But the upshot of the workshop was Number one, we learned how to represent energy visually and tied to actual infrastructure uh, changes and actual engineering systems, which I think is, is very helpful for thinking about this. We couldn't generate any plausible scenarios for full decarbonization yet, but now we know what the questions we need to ask, we know what the challenges are and where to begin experimenting. I think we also managed to strengthen a local network that can be used to address this issue, and we can craft tiered policies to accelerate our progress. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a zoom out to kind of throw some big ideas at you and then zoom back in to tee up Ian. That's the plan. So um, I uh, am grappling on a day-to-day -day basis, given that I'm an interdisciplinary sustainability scholar and climate change scholar. I work uh, mostly in urban spaces. Um, I'm grappling with what it means to transform, what it means to transform an urban space, an energy system. Um, the scale of that challenge, it would seem, as aptly demonstrated by Heather, is rather challenging to get our arms around. The complexity is perhaps beyond the capacity of our puny brains, and yet, uh, we're faced with some pretty existential challenges that we're trying to, to deal with here, as well as, I will try to say again and again, remarkable opportunities to improve our lot, to improve the way our communities function, um, and our health, and biodiversity, and such. So, 
I'm going to be talking about what transformation in the context of an energy system might mean and how to accelerate it. And I'm going to finish off with um, a couple of tidbits about what's happening here in Canada right now uh, and what we can do to push that process along. So um, to begin, just a couple of, of questions for you. What is transformation? What exactly is it that we are trying to transform and who does that? And how can we accelerate that process? Whether we like it or not, we are in fact in the midst of a transformation. It's just not perhaps going the way we might want it to. So this is a whole series of curves that are going up into the sky very rapidly on many, many indicators, some of which are hilarious, some of which are not hilarious. There used to be one in here uh, contributed by an excellent environmental science scholar named Diana Liverman, uh, which was the number of Big Macs consumed or something like that uh, around the globe. Um, we are experiencing a transformation of biophysical and human systems. It's sort of galloping away beyond our control in both, so in both the, the biophysical side as well as the social side. And some people call this the great acceleration. Others are talking about this idea of the Anthropocene, which I'm sure you've all heard about, that humans are now this geological force. 2,000, 10,000 years from now, you'll dig down into the ground and you'll see that we were here and that we were changing the way the planet as a whole functions. So we're in this new era, the Anthropocene. But is this acceleration, this great acceleration of consumption of fuels, of nutrients, of pollution of waterways, of reduction of biodiversity, etc. Is this the path we want to go on? So we're in the midst of a transformation whether we like it or not. Can we critically reflect on the role we play here on the planet to do something different, something better? What is being transformed? Well, really everything, as that uh, graph just showed. But this is, of course, the planetary boundaries um, idea put forward by Johan Rockström and others at the Stockholm Resilience Center, illustrating that uh, in terms of the planet, there are these sort of nine categories uh, of biophysical systems that we are trying desperately not to push over a tipping point into a wildly uncertain world where change kind of escalates beyond our control. We've already exceeded what they would say are planetary boundaries on three of those, of those areas, climate change being one of them. Um, but there are other things like novel entities, which refers to sort of nano uh, particles and, and new, um, new toxics that we don't at all understand the impacts of. But this is a very scientific, if I can use that word, <laughs> destroy that word, framing of what's happening on the planet. There are obviously social transformations going on as well. And this is one image which many of you have perhaps seen before that I've shown in the past that illustrates that transformation, where the technical and the natural come together with the social in one space, our communities. So this is one delightful, welcoming image of uh, near Burnaby in Vancouver, so not typically what you imagine when you think about Vancouver, leafy, walkable, uh, oceanside, yoga, pant-wearing type <laughs> scenarios. This, but this is, in reality, the majority of the region. Wide streets, good for cars, not much else, um, not very beautiful, uh, not very dense, except for that one sore thumb sticking out, which, by the way, is not the way density needs to happen. If there's any planners in the room, it doesn't need to be single-family detached homes and then a 30-story. Anyway, there's better ways to do this. So this is what it looks like right now. But can we envision, can we stretch our imaginations to a radically different future for this little slice of Burnaby and perhaps Kitchener, Waterloo, and surrounding areas? So if we did, it could look like this. This is just kind of everything thrown at the wall. Um, in fact, those tiny micro turbines would not work, physicist told me. I didn't make this image. But this is a photoshopped image of that same area where um, there's no room for cars, actually. No cars at all. Uh, we have active transportation. We have rapid transportation. We have local food being provided to people who could live right above where they work. So um, a more of a mixed use moderate density, three to four story, livable, healthy, physically healthy, um, aesthetically beautiful, renewably, renewable energy powered community. So this is kind of everything all at once. It is tempting to think about the transformation of our energy system as one of technologies. That is 
only, as we know very well, one, one slice of the problem. The values that underpin our use of those technologies, all of the values that this implies, that a single family detached home is not a mark of your place in the world, that owning a single occupancy vehicle is not a display of wealth, that we can get around and move and live in different ways. Um, those are the tough things to shift. That's what's built the inertia into our system and into the use of the technologies that we have in the communities that we have. So what I'm trying to stress here is that this is a deeply social and political challenge, not simply a technological one. So this is, in my view, what is being transformed. So then, who's at play here? Who's doing the work of transforming this energy system, this transportation system, these buildings, into something different, into a decarbonized community by 2050? Well, I listed a whole bunch. There would be, obviously, municipal government designing a land use plan that allowed for um, compact mixed-use development. There would be a federal government putting fuel efficiency standards and other limits on cars. There would be a price on carbon rejigging the market so that that externality is internalized. But there's also a set of actors that I like to focus on a lot uh, right now because, essentially, I, th I think they're being ignored largely uh, by government and others, despite the fact that innovation was splashed all around in the budget a few days ago. Small businesses. So this is where I'm focusing a lot of my effort on this uh, majority of our economy, a major employer of Canadians, of course, um, major provider of public goods, and yet there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of small businesses that are kind of the fabric of our communities. Um, and individually, there are very low emitters. So we tend to ignore them. We focus on the big Whoppers, the Walmarts, and the Coca-Colas, and the big transnational corporations who have the emissions of a small country. Collectively, however, small businesses are responsible for a huge portion of the emissions in this country, and also come up with the technological solutions and the social practices that could lead to a transformation in our energy system. So um, we're, my team and I, um, as part of the Sprout Lab, Sustainability Policy Research on Urban Transformations. Um, we're working on trying to uncover the motivations of small businesses, why they might innovate. That little box in the bottom corner is the transformative potential of small businesses and what inhibits them. On the flip side of that, what partnerships with various levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal could accelerate their potential to transform the energy system? So there's a lot of, there's promising um, room here for small businesses not just to, you know, print double-sided on their paper and, and work from home occasionally, but actually to rethink their business model in a way that is more than corporate social responsibility, that is in fact putting social good and environmental good on par or even ahead of profit. And that's possible, even more possible when you're not publicly traded in a large company with a uh, responsibility to produce profit for your shareholders. So there is a radical potential amongst this little crowd of SMEs to transform our energy system. How do we accelerate that process? Well, I've hinted at a couple of, uh, a couple of ways. Partnerships between government and small businesses have really been promising in helping them overcome some capacity gaps, technical, financial, and human. And uh, in a sort of former life, I was working with a small business in Vancouver, actually, the yoga pant wearing capital of the world, um, to train other small businesses to measure and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So there was a lot of potential there. That, and those SMEs took on more ambitious reductions uh, targets than you might typically find in a lar larger corporate entity. Um, was anyone here for Jeffrey Sachs talk? Yesterday, Jeffrey Sachs was here, a couple. Okay, so he's a very famous economist, uh, inspiring and incredibly um, accomplished person. I had a conversation with him yesterday after his, uh, yesterday morning, uh, the morning after his, after his talk. Um, and we were talking about what is needed to push forward, in this case, the climate change adaptation agenda in Canada to really help communities respond to climate change through adaptation. Similar conversation could have had it been had around energy. And, and his reply was well-meant and well-informed, obviously, um, that we need much better climate science. We need downscale climate models. We need to understand um, uh, why, wh how fast climate is changing and, uh, and what's going on in, in Canada so that communities can plan better. The problem is that we have 
a lot of evidence to suggest that even if we put flawless information in front of people, they don't act the way we would hope they would. Um, the election of Donald Trump is an excellent example of a rising tide of anti-intellectualism and a imperviousness to fact, <laughs> which Canadians are not immune to. There are, um, we've seen these rumblings within Canada as well. So how can we accelerate this process? There's an irony here, and I'm going to throw a couple theses at you, uh, but they mean something more than that. So generally speaking, common knowledge is the more we know, the better we understand risks. Give me more information, I'll make a better decision. I just need to know more. All of our institutions of higher learning are kind of founded on this idea that if we impart more facts, we do better. However, um, if we turn to our colleagues in behavioral economics and uh, social psychology and such, they would say, we interpret what we learn according to the values of the group that we fit in with. This is important, and I'll uh, quote this paper by Mercer and Sperber. We use reason not so much to improve knowledge and to make better decisions, but instead to make arguments that persuade others and ourselves that our instincts are right in the first place. So if you have a strong conservative over here and a strong liberal, liberal over here and you present them with the same facts, they'll just become more conservative and more liberal. They'll just get better at defending their own values, given more information. This is nowhere more evident than in Trump's America. So what does that mean? Well, there's lots of ideas about how to gently nudge behavior instead. So forced compliance can be ridiculously expensive and ill-advised in general, but incentives, indirect suggestions, paying attention to those values that underpin our behaviors might be much more effective. We have to engage citizens, as Heather described in the visioning process for Decarbonize Waterloo, in a way that is deeper than just the deficit model. You have a hole in your information and I'm gonna fill it with the truth and then I expect you to behave in X, Y, Z ways. It doesn't work. <laughs> it hasn't worked for decades. So we need to understand the influence of values and emotions and social pressure. Overall, there's a couple of ingredients that are particularly important, one of which Heather described, which is this kind of visioning process. Governance is crucial. There's a paper that just came out about three or four days ago in Science, written by Johan Rockström and others, talking about pathways to decarbonization by 2050. Um, right there, <laughs> in fact. Um, and it's a really great example, uh, I mean, it's very short, as Nature you know, Science articles tend to be, but essentially what they're saying is you need to set the stage really fast, right now. You need to put in all of the policy tools, like a price on carbon and others, so that um, the market gets it right to send signals to create those radical innovations 10 or 20 years down the line. You can't wait. Um, otherwise, there's pretty much no hope of those things emerging when you want them to. In Canada, I'm just gonna leave you with a couple of bits that are happening right here so that Ian can follow up. We have, of course, um, a, what I would describe as a sea change in perspective, we hope, at the federal level relative to what came prior um, with the Pan-Canadian Framework on Climate Change and Ontario's Climate Change Plan, of course, and the implementation of the cap and trade with varying perspectives on whether or not it's going to be our economic demise or whether it's actually going to trigger the kind of innovation that I just said we need. Um, Canada, some parts of Canada tend to identify as um, hearers of wood, drawers of water, resource-based kind of country, in the energy sector in particular. We are a renewable energy superpower. We have unbelievable resources for renewable energy here, and so we have the resources we need to create uh, a decarbonized Canada by 2050, but setting the policy stage and tackling those values and the inertia behind our current modes of behavior in communities will be a crucial uh, element of success. I leave that with you, and I pass it to Ian. Thanks. First of all, thank you for having me today. It's good to come home to my alma mater. The last time I was here, this room was an awesome bar. Um, so I'm going to focus on the government uh, slash regulatory response to how to decarbonize our economy. I'm also going to ask the question or answer the question, how fast and at what cost? And um, what I'm primarily going to concentrate on is the cap and trade, but I'm going to start with a higher level approach. 
I just want to touch the, on something that Sarah said, that you said, Sarah, which I would love to talk to. I could spend two hours talking about this, but I'm not going to talk about it in the presentation. And I think it's brilliant what you said is how do you cause the behavioral change that's required uh, without forcing it at the, uh, from above. Um, and uh, if you want to talk to me afterwards, ask me, the, ask me my thoughts on a modified version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how to speak to what really interests people, whether they be right-wing conservative or left-wing socialists, on how to achieve a common purpose at a societal level. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, first part is um, ener um, energy transitions, how fast and at what cost. Well, I, I don't want to insult you with these next few slides, but I do want to I want to underscore the importance of this. Um, there, is no, there is no question um, it, that the Earth is heating up. Um, there is no question that it's a costly um, phenomenon. Uh, 2012 Hurricane Sandy, Category 2 uh, hurricane, largest Atlantic hurricane on record, $75 billion in damage, and 233 people killed. Uh, winter 2013 ice storm. Uh, this is a picture of a Brampton neighborhood, $200 million in damage. Uh, summer 2013 uh, Ontario flood. Um, picture of a massive downpour that caused the flooding of the Don River in Toronto. Uh, this flood is considered Ontario's most costly natural disaster at $850 million in damage. Uh, perhaps Canada's most costly uh, da uh, natural disaster at all was the um, Calgary flood in 2013 uh, with $6 billion in damage. Um, between 1983 and 2004, the Insurance Bureau of Canada um, uh, insured losses from catastrophic disasters uh, they ranged from about, they were approximately averaging about $370 million per year in payouts uh, in 2015 dollars. From the period 2015 to 2000, sorry, from 2005 to 2015, however, that number jumped to $1.2 billion per year in payouts. So the, uh, the answer to the question, um, how fast and at what cost? Uh, this is a picture of, this is, taken last, this is from last month, two months ago actually, uh, the Canadian drought monitor showing, uh, this is the middle of winter, showing um, what's to come, uh, abnormally dry areas and moderately uh, drought areas. That will, you'll probably see that map change quite a bit over the next month or so. Uh, the social cost, disease, water scarcity, mass migration, civil unrest, and war. So to answer the question, how fast to decarbonize our economy? The answer is now. Uh, to answer the question, at what cost? Well, the real question should be, uh, what cost must we pay for the consequences of our inaction? And the answer is, our generation will not pay the true cost of that. Uh, the generation that will pay the true cost of our inaction is our children's generation and their children's generation. So the real question should be is what are we willing to pay for our children and for their children to avoid the disastrous consequences of our inaction? And uh, this Greek proverb, uh, a great society, a society knows it's great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in, I think it um, summarizes how we need to be uh, modifying our own attitudes and behavior towards what has to happen to avoid the disastrous consequences for the future generations. Uh, and if you can see this cartoon, uh, father and son, son, one day you will appreciate the truly important things in life as he plants and waters a sapling and then the son pushing his daughter uh, many years later in the tree. Thanks, Dad. So, um, the, um, so I'm going to now talk about the market-based solution um, and to, to causing behavior modification. And there's really two market-based approaches. One is cap and trade. One is a carbon tax. Um, which is better? I say either one. Just do it. Pick one and go for it. Um, British Columbia has a carbon tax. The tax applies to fossil fuels burned. Um, a company knowing its carbon emissions can adjust strategies to be less dependent on carbon-intensive fuels. 
Cap and trade, as another example of, a, of, a, of a, an instrument, sets limits on the quantity of emissions that a company um, can emit through the use of emissions permits. Uh, Quebec, California, and now Ontario have cap, caps and trade, cap and trade programs. Which is better? Well, the question we might want to look in answering that question is how's, how's BC's carbon tax doing? Um, does it really work? Well, for a carbon tax to be effective, and Sarah touched on this a little bit, it must be high enough to influence behavior and to cause behavioral transformation. The problem with BC's tax is that it's too small. It was implemented in 2008 at $10 per ton, carbon, to, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. Currently, it's at about $30 a ton, which experts such as David Suzuki say is, is way too low, and I agree. Which is why you see on this graph, not a huge um, change from when it was implemented in 2005 until where we are now. If you look at it, we could drill down a little bit more here on this graph. So as a function of uh, um, ratios of greenhouse gas emissions to, to, to 1990 level, levels, um, the carbon tax was implemented in, uh, sorry, in 2008. Um, immediately after it was implemented, greenhouse gas emissions did drop, but that was not a function of the tax. That was a function of the economic uh, disaster or economic crisis. Um, and then, as you can see, uh, since uh, 2009 uh, in BC, this is BC, uh, their emissions have slowly been increasing uh, as a ratio relative to the 1990 levels. You can see population has also increased, so has their GDP, um, um, which is, so nor on a normalized basis, while their emissions might be performing okay, uh, the environment and the planet does not care about normalized emissions. The environment and the planet only cares about absolute emissions. So um, clearly the answer to the question, does a carbon tax work? It might, but if it's set at levels uh, like BC's carbon tax, the answer is no, they, it won't work. Um, if you want an example of, of jurisdictions where a carbon tax does work, I suggest you take a look at Sweden. Um, this is a list of the top uh, jurisdictions in the world that have priced carbon. It's a mixture of tar taxation and cap and trade. Sweden has uh, priced their carbon at $137, or $100, yeah, $137 US per ton. Um, Sweden, uh, since they implemented this tax, has reduced their absolute emissions, not their intensity, not carbon per GDP, but absolute, by 25%. Um, on, and they have expanded their economy by 100%. So they're considered one of the most competitive economies in the world. So the, any, any critic who says, well, a carbon tax is going, or a carbon pricing is going to uh, impede uh, a country's ability to compete needs to study this a bit more. And it's interesting, as you go down this list, so as the price per carbon per ton decreases, um, the effectiveness of their perfor environmental performance uh, also decreases. So, drilling down to Ontario's cap and trade. Uh, just to give you a bit of education on that, um, it's, uh, the Ontario cap and trade applies to uh, emitters um, who exceed 25,000 tons per year. Um, it applies to electricity importers, to facilities, uh, industrial facilities, or any facility for that matter, or natural gas distributors that emit 25,000 tons or more per year. And it also applies to fuel suppliers who sell more than 200 liters of fuel per year. The approach is that um, the, those organizations are uh, required to, have been required to report their emissions over the last couple of years. They've each been granted or prescribed a threshold based on their historical performance. And now each year they're required to bring those emissions down. Um, uh, this is what the Ontario Cap and Trade program is going to require starting in 2017. This is the tonnage for Ontario, it's 142 million tons, that's the cap. Uh, so every organization, every reporting entity within the province, uh, by uh, according to wh where the, what each of their thresholds is now, um, is required to uh, contribute to this cap. Um, and each year as we go uh, forward, uh, that cap comes down. So that's kind of the essence of a cap and trade. 
uh, organizations, reporting entities are required to bring their, their cap, their emissions down. If they can't do that, then they need to purchase uh, uh, pollution uh, permits um, from other entities, other, reporting, other participants in the cap and trade. So it's a market-based approach. How effective do caps, cap and trade programs tend to be? Well, you can look at the, um, what was done to uh, eliminate acid rain in, in 1980. So in 19, or 1990, um, the acid rain program was established under the U.S. Clean Air Act. It was a cooperative effort between Canada and the United States. It required major emitters of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides to comply with uh, permanent and progressive cap. And what did it do? Well, this is, a cap, this is a graph showing Ontario's performance. You can see the cap in 1990 was set at 3.2 million metric tons of uh, sulfur dioxide emissions per year. And uh, since then, the numbers have come down dra uh, drastically to the point where acid rain primarily is a thing of the past, although there's still some vulnerable areas within the, within the country. But um, the water bodies have all, re have all recovered from the damage that was done. Uh, by the way, the market... Um, the, the market-based mechanism that produced the effectiveness of this result was that they had set the price per ton of sulfur dioxide emissions at $130. So you can see, you know, $10, $30, it's not, that's nothing. That's not going to produce the desired behavioral change. So the cap must be low enough to achieve desired results, and the pollution permits must be uh, expensive enough to warrant change and, uh, in behavior and practice and the cap must be lowered every year. Those are the three key uh, traits of a successful cap and trade program. In Ontario, in 1990, we emitted 177 uh, million metric tons. In 2012, we dro dropped that down to 167. That was with no market-based approach. The only thing that produced that result was the phasing out of coal-fired electricity plants. We've, so we're, we're kind of at, we've, we've plateaued now, which is why we need to, uh, which is why the Ontario government has had to implement a market-based approach to cause behavioral change. This graph represents what would happen um, in the absence of a market-based approach. Every sector except electricity is expected to continue to increase between now and 2020. So what the Ontario cap and trade, um, how am I doing by the way on time? I've got two minutes, okay. Um, one minute. Okay. The, the Ontario cap and trade lives with inside of the Ontario uh, Climate Change Action Plan. The, um, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, the Climate Change Action Plan is designed to um, produce, behave, could cause behavioral change such that our, um, our emissions, our absolute emissions, um, are reduced by... Um, 27 million tons between now and 2020. So we have a long way to go. Um, the cap and trade program, and so how is that going to be achieved? I mean, I'm sorry for jumping around here, but basically the revenue generated from the selling of pollution permits under the cap and trade program, which is uh, projected to be between five and nine billion dollars, will be pumped back in to the economy to, incent to help businesses uh, and other organizations, residents, homeowners, municipalities, et cetera, adapt um, climate uh, efficient technologies, um, sustainable energy technologies, um, and uh, other low carbon uh, practices. And that will feed a behavioral or a feedback loop that eventually will con keep continuing to lower the emissions over time. That's kind of the philosophy uh, behind and the strategy behind the Climate Change Action Plan. So we have uh, 27 million tons to be reduced through the action plan and the remainder will be caused through behavioral change caused by the cap and trade. I'm sorry for having to sort of fast track this presentation, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And if you want to catch me and talk one-on-one -on -one at the end, I'm happy to do that as well. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for coming today. And, uh, and thanks to 
Armagan and Wise and the University of Waterloo for inviting us to uh, participate in the panel today. Excellent presentation so far. I really, really enjoyed them. I hope everyone has too. So my name is Tim Gibbons. I'm a business development manager with uh, Ontario Centers of Excellence, or OCE. Um, I work here in the Waterloo region. Our office is, my sense of direction is right just across the street there in the Accelerator Center. Um, and I've got about 12 slides today. I should get them, through them on time. I've got a, a couple slides uh, for those that aren't familiar a little bit on who OCE is and what we do. Um, a few slides on uh, Ontario's GHG emissions and reduction targets, 2020 and, and beyond. And then finally, uh, a few specifics on a particular funding program called Target GHG that we're delivering on behalf of the provincial government designed to help them meet their uh, GHG reduction targets, and as, as a secondary goal, uh, spur economic growth. So, that actually does work. Okay, so, who, what OCE does. So, um, I just want to focus on a couple of key points, maybe the first three bullet points on this uh, slide, that we're, uh, we're a not-for-profit agency, um, funding delivery agency. We're not actually part of the government. But we are a platform really for delivering um, government, government funding programs. Um, traditionally, most of those funds have come from the Ministry of Research, Innovation and Science. But increasingly, uh, these days, we're, we're receiving funding to, uh, to deliver programs on behalf of uh, ministries like Ministry of, of Health and Long-Term Care and Ministry of uh, Environment and Climate Change. And what we really do is we, uh, a lot of what we do is we leverage the full capacity of uh, um, Ontario's research institutions and universities to help technology-based companies uh, commercialize research and deliver economic growth to, uh, to the economy. Just a little example of a, kind of the main areas that we, we, we work in, kind of four main initiatives. One, uh, industry academic R&D collaboration essentially a number of programs around helping companies with technical R&D problems that they can't solve themselves, pairing them with university or college researchers to do some research that, uh, and provide some funding for that. The results then get transferred back to the company and they have a plan to commercialize that and realize economic benefit for the economy in terms of new technologies, new products, job creation, that sort of thing. Um, entrepreneurship, we fund uh, campus-linked accelerators uh, across the province here in Waterloo. That, that includes uh, Velocity here at Waterloo, which is very active. Some of you may, may be familiar with that organization, as well as very early stage uh, startup seed funding through a program called Smart Start. Our commercialization programs include some later stage seed funding for those same type of uh, early stage startups, as well as, um, uh, as, as a lot of, for example, procurement programs for uh, getting technologies into healthcare sector or education sector. And finally, a uh, number of strategic initiatives that, that, that come occasionally, including Target GHG, which we'll talk about a little bit more, that's aimed at helping the province uh, achieve its GHG reduction targets. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Ontario's GHG emissions by, by sector. Um, this chart, these are a couple of years old, so the, some of the, the, the information is a little bit out of date, but I got them from the province's website, so that's, uh, that's the most current ones they have available. So this by sector is where the, the greenhouse gas emissions come from in Ontario, and I'd ask to pay particular attention to the bottom pie slice of uh, 48 uh, megatons from industrial emitters. So those, those, those are the large provincial emitters in the province, uh, steel manufacturing companies, cement companies, petrochemical companies like that. So that's kind of where those, those emissions come from in the province today. And you'll see a lot of them are, are obviously transportation and cars and vehicles is a, is a big chunk of that. Um, and emissions by sector in uh, 2013, again, I, sorry, that might be a little bit small to read. And again, this is a bit out of date because you see the largest uh, bar chart there is from electricity generation, and this was just before the province uh, shuttered the coal-fired power generation plant. So that graph would look somewhat different today uh, after, after 2014, but that's, again, that's the most recent, uh, recent one I have. And what do the trends look like since 19, 1990? We can see the top green 
uh, line on the graph is our, our, our GDP, and the blue line is our population, all of which have been obviously increasing since 1990. Um, we can see our GHG emissions, the red line, have actually, on a, on a gross basis, gone down since 1990. We'll talk about, a bit more about that in a minute. And then GHG, both per capita and per, G, per GDP, have, have also decreased since 1990. So what do Ontario's GHG reduction targets look like going forward? Um, so on this graph we see in 2014, and this is the reduction target from the 1990 level. So the target was to, by 2014, to get 6% reduction there. And, and again, as I think Ian was mentioning, that was largely due to the, the shuttering of the, of the coal-fired power generation plant. Um, more ambitious targets for 2020, uh, getting to a 15% reduction from that 2020, sorry, from that 1990 level. Um, and then in 2030, the goal is to be down 37% from that 1990 level. And by 2050, very lofty goal of down 80%. And of course, this is all while presumably the population and the GDP in the province will, uh, will hopefully be increasing. So as some of the other panelists have said, there's, a, there's obviously a number of ways that, uh, that you need to, to, to tackle this problem and changing behavior and uh, market-based solutions. But uh, this particular initiative on behalf of the government, Target GHG, it's, uh, it's part of their $325 million green investment fund. Uh, and they've carved out a $74 million chunk of that and asked OCE to deliver the program. And it's around helping Again, the largest greenhouse, industrial greenhouse gas emitters in the province, those uh, uh, cement companies, steel producers, petrochemical companies, helping them reduce their, their greenhouse gas emissions uh, in accordance with those, those 2020, 2020 to 2030 and beyond 2030 targets. And so there's three separate funding streams uh, in the program um, that make up the program. The first is an industrial demonstration program, which helps those companies meet their kind of short-term GHG target levels for the 2020 goals. There is a, a collaborative R&D and technology development funding stream, which uh, we'll talk about a bit more about in a minute. Uh, that really helps companies develop technologies that help the province meet those 2030 targets. And then a Carbon X Prize uh, and Solutions 2030 Challenge, um, which helps meet the very long-term stretch goals 2030 and beyond. And again, the, the primary goal of the program is to help those industrial emitters reduce their greenhouse gas emissions with the secondary goal of um, developing technologies and expanding the clean tech se sector and, and developing the economy on the Ontario. So a little bit more on, on, on stream one, the, the industrial demonstration program. So the idea here is you take a a large industrial emitter and you pair them with a, a solution provider of some kind and they implement some technology that is able to demonstrate significant GHG reduction by 2020. So it's a program that we just launched uh, this, this year. Um, the applications for the, the current round are actually, actually closed right now but we had very good response to it. We engaged with I would say the majority of the large emitters across the province. And the idea here is that uh, OCE will provide 50% of the project cost for implementing these, uh, these, these technologies up to a total of $5 million. So there could be like a, you know, if it's, if it's a, an $8 million project, OCE would contribute up to $4 million. If it's a $10 million project, we contribute five. If it's a $15 million project, well, we still contribute five. But there's hopefully enough incentive there um, for, for companies to... Um, for large emitters to implement those technologies that demonstrate real GHG reduction by the, by the 2020 period. And part of what OCE's role as well is actually making those connections, pairing those solution providers with the large industrial emitters, which, uh, you know, as much as the funding is helpful, I, I think sometimes those, making those connections are, is just an, an important aspect of what we do. Stream two, uh, collaborative R&D and technology development uh, projects between admitters, clean tech SMEs, and academic institutions. So really, uh, two sub-programs here. One is the collaborative R&D, where we, we, we pair a university researcher 
with, uh, as I say, either clean tech company uh, and maybe a large, uh, large emitter, and they work together to do some research that will, in the end, result in a commercializable technology that will help those large industrial emitters reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And our, our partner, uh, funding partner with OC in that is, is, is NSERC, federal funding agency um, that we've worked with it, uh, quite a bit in the past. And um, again, the, the, the province principal funding is available up to one half of a total eligible project cost of a million, million dollars. And uh, the, the second stream, have I got this right? Nope, I'll go back to stream two. The second, the second part of it is a technology development stream. Our funding partner there is Sustainable Technology Development Corporation, SDTC. And that, again, that is around helping solution providers develop early stage technologies that will ultimately be implemented by those uh, large industrial emitters that will help reduce GHG reduction, help GHGs. Uh, the, the final stream, Stream 3, the Carbon X Prize and Solutions, there's a, there's a COSIA Carbon X Prize competition that's ongoing right now. There are, I believe, three Ontario companies that are participating in that. OC is providing them some funding to help them uh, continue their their uh, technology development there and then very soon in coming weeks we'll be announcing uh, the solutions 2030 challenge will be a tiered award based approach where ultimately uh, the winner of this challenge will receive up to three million dollars in funding but uh, companies at various stages and i think there'll be three tiered stages will receive up to seven million dollars of funding to help them develop their their solution so stay tuned more on that in the coming weeks And again, just a final slide here on the target GHG priorities. Uh, it, it's, it's, again, it's industrial emitters and working to help uh, to solve problems at either an industrial point source, their manufacturing processes, in their value chain, or in carbon capture and, and utilization. Those are kind of the three broad areas that we're looking for solutions for those industrial emitters. And uh, I'm here all day. A couple of my colleagues are here as well. You can find us, and there's a number of particular B, B business development managers across the province who are working particularly in the target GHG area, and those are our contact information there. So I think I'm about right on time. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we have about seven or eight minutes uh, for questions. If you have a question, please just uh, come up to the, uh, uh, to the microphone, um, please, in the, on, on the two aisles. And uh, um, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan, and my question was about innovation. So uh, I read that science paper, uh, I think it was earlier this week, and for us to meet the targets, they want things like superconducting transmission cables and carbon capture such that we'll have negative emissions rates in certain plants. Um, so it seems like a subtext to a lot of the climate change discussions is we need a, we need a lot of innovation really quickly. So I'm just wondering, if you guys think the policies we have in place are supporting that quick of innovation, or if there's more we can do to incentivize and support uh, clean tech innovators. Is, is that directed to any particular or whoever? Whoever. Yeah. Sarah, uh, did sure. you? Do I have a, yeah, can, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll respond in part to that. So uh, I do recommend checking out the science paper. It's in a, there's a phased approach, right? And I think one of the most powerful messages is what do we need to do like today or before 2020, right, 2017 to 2020, in order to set the stage for some of those larger scale, both infrastructure changes as well as, you know, breakthrough technological innovations in the 2020 to 2030 range. And uh, one is a rapid upscaling of carbon capture and storage technology, which is contentious and not quite ready to scale up, but nonetheless, whatever. Others are, um, those tools that do set the stage, like a carbon price, feed-in tariff, et cetera. So that, those are decisions that need to happen right now so that um, the next, you know, people in the next five or six years get the signals that there's going to be a market for that innovation to then, to then scale up and roll out in a meaningful way. It, the, it, another strong message was ending um, all fossil fuel subsidies. So um, that is another way of rejigging those signals so that, um, we don't sort of pile on more to what we, I hesitate to say, I, I need to find a better way of saying this, but 
we don't want those assets to be stranded. That's a better way than saying sinking ship, which is what I was about to say. <laughs> um, but shifting that, those uh, federal funds away from uh, fossil fuel subsidies and towards renewable energy, I think, would be crucial. So that is not yet happening, in my view, uh, fast enough or to the extent we need it to happen. But the new budget is promising in terms of funds directed towards the kind of innovation that Canada needs in particular to get these small startup companies over the hump and, and have them grow, uh, grow and accelerate. So there's some of the, the tools in place, but not enough to yield anything close to what Johan Rockström et al. are hoping for by 2050, for sure. And Anyone else? And I'll just maybe add a, a, a plug to Sarah and I's colleague, Celine Back, B-A-K, at CG, who's done some of the best economic analysis of innovation systems for clean tech in Canada. And I think if you're interested in that, her work is really um, some of the best out there. Hi. Uh, I'm Azhar Ahmad, uh, ESCON Technical Services. One of our solutions partner is uh, Harsan Group. We provide green energy solutions we supply green energy up to 80% green content. Now my question is on pollution permits. What is the significance of pollution permits? What they really stand for? Uh, because what we understand from the cap and trade program is that it is penalizing you that you're emitting carbon to the air. But when this is the stick part of it, what's the carrot part? Are we, if we are able to reduce our emissions uh, by going into contracts, supplying carbon offsets, uh, as well as renewable energy-based electricity, uh, how can we get the benefit in, in the cap and trade program? Now, it seems pollution permit is one of the ways. Uh, can you a bit elaborate on the pollution permit part of it? Who can buy it or who can uh, utilize it? Can a small to medium enterprise be able to you know, get benefit directly? Mm -hmm. okay, we do do that as a Hudson yeah. Group. Okay, so um, when we talk about pollution permits, there's two kinds. There's, there's the kind that right now are being given out for free. Mm -hmm. So the on, under the Ontario uh, climate change, the cap and trade, um, the a certain number of uh, high emitters have been identified as being potentially vulnerable if they are required to go out and purchase pollution permits um, because, the, as the argument goes, they, they, they may leave the province and along with them would go the economic activity that they generate. Is that true or not? I don't know, but there's clearly political pressure that was placed on the government. Yeah, well, it started. So, I beg your pardon? It started. A few of the companies who do electroplating have gone south. Yeah. And it's part of the... Okay, so there's, so, there's, so there's potentially some truth to that. So a, uh, a certain number of high-emitting... Uh, entities have been granted free pollution permits um, between now and uh, and uh, I believe it's 2020. Yeah. That doesn't mean they still can't that, that they're still not obligated to comply with the reduction in the in the cap. They still have to bring their emissions down. It's just that they're not going to pay. They can the permits are free. If they exceed, if if at the end of the year their their carbon inventory is such that it's higher mm -hmm. than the cap, they, then they have to go out into the market and purchase. Permits, so they're not just going to get more free permits to be able to comply. To be able to comply, the other category of emitter are those who don't fall into the into that into the high who aren't high emitters, but who are still above the set 25,000 ton per year threshold. Um, they have to purchase their emission their per pollution um, permits by auction, and the, the first auction was held uh, a couple weeks ago. I haven't seen what the price was, but I know that. Uh, what I read was that they weren't going to auction them off for anything less than $18 per ton, which in my view is still way, way too cheap to cause significant change. Um, so that's, that's the, the purpose of the permit. Now, who can buy them? Anyone can register to purchase permits. You don't even need to be a high emitter. You can, you can even be under the 25,000 ton per year threshold. You can buy the permits and then enter into uh, the aftermarket and sell them for the purpose as an investment mm -hmm. uh, tool. Yeah. yeah. No, my question is... Um, if the emissions are a little less than 25,000 tons, do cap and trade program, I mean, should we be taxed on that? Because I have a small house in Windsor, I am still paying another $40 additional on the cap and trade program. Well, you're not paying it on the cap and trade. What you're paying is the additional cost that's being passed on to you by the natural gas suppliers and 
well, the natural gas supplier really. Ultimately, it comes down to the consumer. Yeah, so they, they're subject to the cap and trade, and they just increase the prices. So, uh, you, you know, you're paying indirectly, but, but I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole point is to cause behavioral change. How do we cause behavioral change? Well, one is through by hitting people in the pocketbook. I, I mean, that's the most effective way. So I, I, I think that this is probably a discussion that uh, we can have in the break as yeah, a sort of sure. offline discussion. Thanks. Sure. Thank Thanks you. very much. Uh, we have time for one really, really quick question. A quick question then. Uh, there are some big ideas that have been, been implemented and are making people money. For example, LEDs taken over the world. Um, I'm just wondering what panelists have seen either in product or policy that they regard as big ideas that might make significant differences uh, to this, uh, this problem. I'll just quickly say, say one thing. So one of, my, one of my favorite quotes at the moment is from William Gibson, the cyberpunk sci-fi author. And he says, uh, the future is already here. It's just, just unevenly distributed, which I kind of like. So <laughs> you, just, you have to look around the world and at some point, in some place, you will see the future, um, if not the future we want, <laughs> the future in one shape or another. Um, and I mean, it's a bit of a cliche to always look to Sweden, but um, one issue that I'd like to put on the table that we almost never talk about in forums like this is ecosystem-based approaches to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So there are neighborhoods, that, the last image I showed is a neighborhood in Sweden, uh, in Malmo, the western harbor, uh, that has used um, ecosystem-based approaches like wetlands to sink carbon, filter water, do all kinds of things for aesthetic and recreational benefits and transform the sort of socio-economic uh, fate of that neighborhood. So that's not a single technology, but it's a nature-based technology that's pretty, uh, pretty promising. Others? Any other cool ideas? So, so for, the, um, for the thermal, just one more thing, for the, the thermal demand, so th there's a lot of, sort of questions about how to actually meet, how to heat our spaces in the winter, because it does get cold here, and it will hopefully continue to get cold here in the winter. So um, well, I know that, uh, you know, Paul Parker's done a lot of work on heat pumps. Uh, the problem is with air source heat pumps is when you get to low temperatures, the coefficient really goes down, and you're sort of basically doing electric res resistance. Um, Ground source heat pumps are great too, but there are places where it's not plausible or um, it's very expensive to drill down. And I have a neighbor who says like, yeah, I can't even do it in my yard because of the substrate. Like it just, it just doesn't, it's not even allowed. So there's this really interesting project out in Alberta outside of Calgary called Drake's Landing where they do solar thermal seasonal storage. So they have solar thermal panels, which are not photovoltaics, they just heat, and they heat a 30 meter wide, 30 meter deep implantation underground of cement and sand. And then they s draw the heat, so they heat that over the summer, and they use that heat to do district heating in the winter. And they've gotten 100% heating in Calgary out of this, which is remarkable. So now we need to pilot that in our region, see if it would work here, maybe as a retrofit, maybe on University Waterloo graduate student housing. I don't know. These are some ideas, right? So there are things that could be brought in from other places. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel uh, one more time.